We're going to continue this morning in our series on Ecclesia. This is the fourth week in that series, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again. So if you want to turn in your Bible or in your device to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that would be great. Ecclesia is the Greek word for our English word. Church, good. First service really struggled with that. You guys did great. Jesus is the founder of the church. Jesus is the builder of the church. Jesus is the one that tells us that the church will ultimately be victorious, that the church will not fail. Last week we looked at the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church primarily is to make disciples. We do a lot of other important things too as a body, as a, as a group of those called out in Jesus, but it is to make disciples. And I want us to pray together as we start this service, and we're going to do this probably for the next several weeks, just inviting the Holy Spirit to help us um, let go of anything that we believe about the church that is not from the Lord, that's not biblical. It's just super easy to do. And here's the thing, it usually comes out of some point of pain, that a bad experience. Um, we end up creating in our minds and in our hearts particular attitudes or postures in regard to church, in regard to ecclesia, that will prevent us from being able to fully experience the richness of what God has intended for this group to be, not just our group, but any small church, any small C church. So um, I want us to pray and ask the Lord as uh, the Holy Spirit is our teacher to teach us what is actually true and right and to let go of that which is inaccurate. So can we do that again? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for always being... Um, so faithful to continue to come and, and to bring us to yourself so that you can remove that which doesn't belong and place within us that which does. And we ask that you would do that this morning. I ask that you would do that to all of us this morning as we open your word and as we look to the truth of scripture to help us frame our understanding of the church accurately and biblically. Lord, where we have been hurt by church, and I know even in a, in a room like this, there are literally probably dozens of people that can say, yeah, I've, I was just really hurt by the church. Lord, I pray that even as we're learning about Ecclesia, you would be, um, you would be pouring the oil of the Spirit into our hearts and into our wounds so that we can be healed. Lord, we want to not carry that stuff into the future where it's been hurtful from the past. And we pray this this morning in the name of Jesus. And if you agree, would you say amen? Amen. 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 So this morning, we're going, to, we're going to dive into where we left off last week, starting in verse 21 of chapter 12. 1 Corinthians, in the first chunk between verses 12 and 20, we covered a, a, a lot of different little points last week, that we are all different, that we are diverse by God's design within the church. I'm going to touch on some of those again today, talking about unity, how the body needs itself and all of the parts are vital. And it is actually the Lord that places everybody in the church. It's his design. It's his um, creative input that causes the church to be the way that it is. Um, he is the master designer. He is the master designer. And everything that he wants to take place within the church, our job is not so much to try to arrange them, but to, but to be cooperative with what he is doing. So the pastors think, of terms, we're going to build the church this way. I already talked about building the church. That's not our job. But we're going to do this and this, and we have all these strategies. And let me just say, there's nothing wrong with having strategy. There's nothing wrong with having vision. There's nothing wrong with the church having a mission, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff is fine. However, he's the master designer. And at the end of the day, we have to be willing to submit ourselves to who it is that he's bringing and how it is that he is wanting us to function with one another. When Susan and I, uh, in another life, we planted a church in a, in a town, and part of the preparation process was to create this, this uh, caricature of who we were hoping to reach, which is not a bad thing to do. It's like the town was called Charlestown. It's where we lived. We lived in Charlestown. And so we created a person named Charlestown Charlie. And for real, we did. Now, we, we, it wasn't like Frankenstein creation. We just had this idea that this is what Charlestown Charlie is going to be like. And we had all these characteristics and all these things about Charlestown Charlie. When the church got off the ground and we started to like meet together and church started to grow, there was nobody, not even one person that was even remotely close to Charlestown Charlie. Because when God's doing something, he gets to be the builder of the church. He gets to be the master designer. He brings the people that he wants to be within the local, the local church body. Amen? So we're submitting that to the Lord. We're saying, Lord, we want to be cooperative with what you're doing. So look with me in verse 21. 
I'm just going to read that first verse, and we're going to do this in sections. Verse 21 of chapter 12 says this. Again, Paul writing to the Corinthians. This is one huge analogy, physical body, spiritual body, or the body of Christ. He says this. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. One part of the body cannot dismiss, cannot cannot remove, cannot push away another part of the body. Can't do that. It's not supposed to happen. Paul says it cannot happen. Uh, in the earlier part last week, we looked at one of the verses 15 and 16. They talk, um, and verse 15 says this, if the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong in the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. In last week's section, the Paul's talking about people who are self-disqualifying. They're saying, because I'm not like some other part that I perceive as more important, therefore I'm not in the body anymore. We cannot self-disqualify. This week, verse 21, Paul says, you also can't disqualify someone else. You can't look at someone else and say, we don't need that person in this body. They're, they're not important. We, obviously, the physical is absurd. You'd never look at a part of your body and say, you know, I mean, maybe your appendix. But other than that, you would never look at a part of your body and say, I don't need you in this body. I need all of my parts. You know, we need all of the parts together. So we're not allowed to self-disqualify and we're not allowed to others disqualify when it comes to the way that God is constructing the small C church that we're a part of. Write this down if you would. Individual parts of the body cannot exclude themselves or others from the church. Cannot be done. Must not be done. Unfortunately, it is done. It does happen. And when it does happen, it is sin. For someone to be driven out of the church because some particular member of the body thinks that that other member of the body isn't important to try to drive them away is sin. And it is also sin for me if I say, I'm not important. I don't belong here. There's no place for me in this church. That is also sinful. As a matter of fact, when people say, and I hear that pretty frequently, people say, everybody at church seems so good with each other and they're all so happy and everything. I just don't fit. That is also sin. We are not allowed to disqualify ourselves. If you are here, and I don't mean specifically this church, Grace, but if you are a part of a small C church, you are needed in that church. Don't echo the words of the enemy when he says you're not important because you are important. Amen? Turn to the person next to you and say, you are important. You are really important. Look at verse 22. I want to read 22, 23, and half of 24. Paul says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, I'm sorry, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. Paul says, th this is the way that it is um, in the world. People say, you don't belong here. We say about ourselves, we don't belong here. He says, but that's not the way it's going to be within the body of Christ. On the contrary, the weaker parts are indispensable. The less honorable parts are shown greater honor. The unpresentable parts are given greater modesty. This is where we start to see how the church is so, so very strange compared to the culture. I want you to just, I just want you to let this kind of rest in your heart. This thing called church is unlike any other organization on the face of the earth, at least by design. Where, where these parts that are weak or these parts that are less honorable or these parts that they're not presentable... That may be true other places, but that's never true here. In the body of Christ, everyone has a place. Everyone is pulled in. You know how the world works, right? There's, there's concentric circles. It's, there's the in crowd. Were any of you in the in crowd? Don't raise your hand. And then there's the, I want to be in, but I'm not in the in crowd. There's a bunch of us in that one. And then there's the probably not in the in crowd. And then there's the definitely not in the in crowd. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. And then, and then there is the, there's a crowd, you know, group <laughs> way out here. That's the way the world works, right? And you all kind of know, we all kind of know where we're at. The church is the one place in the world where we're always saying, come inside. There's room for you in here. There's a place for you here. You're wanted here. You're welcome here. You matter here. You're seen here. It's safe here. 
It should be the one place where all of the, all of the, the ways that the culture works around us that are just so anti-Christ, that are so anti-God, here is the one place where it should be the, the exception to the rule, where people are treated with love, where people, where people are treated with respect, where people are honored even if they're not honorable. Let's look at the three pieces really quickly. Weaker parts are indispensable. Indispensable means what you think it means, what you cannot do without, that which is essential. Weak parts do not mean useless parts. Weak parts do not mean unimportant parts. Think about your body for a second. I have some strong parts of my body and some weak parts of my body. So do you as well. Like, so if I were to, like our bones are strong, right? If I were to... Um, be in a fight with Susan, and she slugs me in the rib cage, and she cracks my rib. If that ever happened again, if that ever happened again, <laughs> that would be bad. It hurts to get, I mean, broken ribs is a bad thing. That's a, certainly a painful thing. However, that's a strong part of my body. Underneath of those ribs is a weaker part of my body that's even more important, my lungs, my heart. So cracked rib is terrible. Collapsed lung is really bad. Damaged heart is awful. Weak does not mean unimportant. Weak does not mean um, non-essential. Some of the weakest parts of our physical bodies are the most valuable. And the same thing is true with the church. The church body has to function the same way. We protect the weaker parts because oftentimes they are absolutely essential. They're even more vital than the things that we think are more presentable and strong. Second piece Scripture says that greater honor in the church goes to those who are less honorable. When a member of the church seems less honorable, less worthy of respect, less worthy of reverence, less well-esteemed, when that happens, according to the Scriptures, they're supposed to get more honor. That's backward from culture. When someone is not honorable in our culture, for whatever reason, it is very acceptable. As a matter of fact, it's encouraged to ignore that person, to avoid that person, to shame that person, to criticize that person. What a difference within the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, when someone is less honorable, what we're supposed to do is see that and move toward them. Where they are at a deficit, we're supposed to come along and give them even more honor to help build them up, to help, to help bless them, to help take care of them. Let me give you a quick example. We've all been in a shopping or a dining situation in public and somebody starts acting out. I mean, they're, they're acting foolishly or they're being extra rude to the people around them or maybe it's a, a child that's just like losing his or her little mind in a restaurant. You, raise your hand if you've ever known what I'm talking about. Culturally, the most acceptable thing to do is this. Well, first of all, be complained. But then it's like, let's just, let's just get out of it. Like, that's happening in this aisle. Let's go to this aisle, you know? Let's just avoid that situation. The church is the exact opposite. Someone's acting less honorably. We're supposed to move towards them. How can I help? How can I serve you? What do you need? What, what, what would help make this situation better? When we come together, it is our opportunity to do exactly the, the opposite thing that the world around us is doing. The unpresentable parts, Paul says, are given greater modesty. Now, when you read that, immediately for me, I think of, you know, our reproductive organs, which we, tra we treat with the greatest modesty, but the word unpresentable also means deformed. That if something in the body is not quite like it's supposed to be, it's not quite exactly as God intended it to be, that, that that part is given greater modesty and greater covering in love. And how much is that um, done in the world around us? That which is deformed, that which is unpresentable, that which is indecent is celebrated or mocked or drawn attention to, not within the body of Christ. It's almost like we see the weaknesses, the, de the, de the deformed parts of the body, and we just make allowances for that person. Recently, I was at, at, a, at a meal where there was a person that was just, you ever been at a meal and there's just one person that's just not getting it? Like, they're like three conversations behind, and they keep coming back in, and you're like, no, we, we were there 10 minutes ago, but you know, it was one of those conversations, and everybody at the table except the one person was... Um, was kind of keeping up with where things were going. There was jokes going on, laughter and stuff. And this person was very clearly behind. And if that's you, I'm sorry. But very clearly was behind. And I was watching the other people at the table. 
And they just kept making allowances for this person and including them and encouraging them. And to a person, everyone made a point of referencing that person so they were still a part of the table. They were still a part of the meal. That's the church. It's not like, oh gosh, she's at my table. But it's, she's at my table. And I get to take care of her. I get to go the extra mile to use Jesus' words. She's a little damaged or he's a little bit deformed, but he's welcome here. The church is designed to function in a manner that is counter to both the culture and our natural inclinations. Because all the culture is, is the sum total of a lot of people's natural inclinations. The church is supposed to work backward from that. It's about valuing the people that God brings into the body Because they are made in his image, period. Look at verse um, 24, 20, I'm sorry, the back half of 24, 25, and 26. 24b says, God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that all the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, then all rejoice together. Again, this, this idea of the Lord, last week we talked about he places all the pieces together, but the word composed means mixture, It means like God intentionally brought people who were weak and who were less honorable and who were less presentable into the church. And this is really important because we think of them, not that we're any of them, but those other people that are less honorable and less presentable and weaker, we think of them and we we almost think like this, well, one day that weak part will get strong. One day that less honorable person will become more honorable. One day that, that less presentable person will be more presentable. And I, as I read this, I'm not sure that's accurate. They're in the mix on purpose. Specifically, they're part of this, this recipe. Now, some people in the recipe are just, they're just easy, right? Like if you're around Gary Flockstra, he's just easy. I mean, he's just easy to be around. The guy is just, yeah, raise your hand if you've ever been around somebody making cookies or you've made cookies. All right, good. We're a cookie eating group. If Susan's making cookies and I walk through the, I walk through the kitchen, I can see the brown sugar on its own and I'm like, score. I can just grab some brown sugar and I'm good, Right? Grab some brown sugar, and I'm good, right? Because brown sugar is good on its own. I never walk by and see the flour sitting in the bowl, and I'm like, ooh, flour. Let's grab some flour. Mmm, that would be just, I mean, that's terrible. I mean, I suppose you need it for the cookies, but you would never eat that on its own. That's the way that the church is. The church has parts of it that are just, they're, they're really great and everything, but the, the parts that are less wonderful, less attractive, less desirable when mixed with the best parts give us something that's better than what any of the individual parts could have been on their own. That's what the church is like. The analogy, I got to give you this last little piece. The, some people in the church are like vanilla extract. <laughs> you ever smell vanilla extract? It's wonderful smelling. If only it tastes like it smells. Some people, you get around the church, you're like, well, they seem really nice, and then you get to know them, and you're like, whoa, okay. (laughs) We still need them in the mixture. We still need them to be part of the recipe. God has intentionally brought them to us. They're their own purpose. And he says he does this, the scripture says this, because he doesn't want there to be any division within the body. The diversity of the body is what keeps us unified. I know it seems counterintuitive. Like if we were just all the same, we would get along. But that's not true. If we were all the same, if everybody in the body was a bicep, we would be able to tell who was the strongest. If everybody in the body was an eyeball, we'd be able to see who could see the farthest. If everybody in the body was, was a foot, we'd be able to see who was the fastest. But that's not God's design for the body. God's design for the body is such that the differences among us and between us cause us to be able to appreciate each other and not compare. 
I can look at somebody who's a bicep within the church and think, man, I'm glad we have their strength, but I don't want to rely on the bicep to do the seeing for us. We need the eyeball to do that. I don't want to rely on the eyeball to do the moving for us because we need the feet to do that. Affirming and celebrating our differences is what makes us happy. Diversity enables us to value our differences without the need to compare. Diversity with unselfishness creates the church that we all want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a church where everybody gets appreciated, where everybody gets valued, where everybody gets strengthened, where everybody is included. This, this body of Christ stuff is... Um, it just sounds so good. I said this last week, but I, I got to keep coming back to it. It just sounds wonderful. Wouldn't it be great to be a part of a church that, is, that's like, that functions in the way that Paul says it should in 1 Corinthians 12? I mean, I, I want that. It's, it's amazing. But at the same time, it's extremely difficult to be a part of that kind of church. It's extremely hard because... People are difficult. People are less honorable. People are weak. People are unpresentable. It's difficult to have that church, which is why, which is why folks tend to find churches where they can spectate rather than connect. I'm going to keep hitting this because it's really important. And this, this has nothing to do with the church's size. It has everything to do with whether or not it is truly a body of Christ where every part is giving their gift and giving their talent to make the body move forward. If a church is something that we just spectate at, we are consuming a product. I mentioned that last week. I, you're going to hear me say it a bunch of times because I want, I want this to be part of our understanding of letting go and grabbing hold. But if a church is something that we consume and it's not something that we're intri intricately connected to, we will get a sense of community, but we will not have a real connection. We will be inspired, but we won't necessarily be transformed. We can associate, but we won't be really invested. If that's the church that we end up going to, we will not experience the richness of what God has described in his word as the body of Christ. It cannot happen that way. And Grace Church can never become that kind of a church. The key for this whole thing, though, is all of us pressing in to Jesus. When all of the parts of the body are, are leaning in to be closer to the Lord, we are all being drawn together. What, over the years, I've done marriage counseling a handful of times with different couples. And, and one, of the, one of the very simple but helpful visual reminders I will give couples is you draw a big triangle on a piece of paper, I mean, this is super technical, and you put a G at the top for, you guys are on it, and the husband and the wife, and as they move towards the Lord, they are being drawn together. The exact same analogy holds for the church. If we are all pressing into Jesus, we will be drawn closer together. We will experience unity. We will be part of the body of Christ as the head dictates and controls what's happening. To become, write this down if you would, last one, to become a healthier local church, we must pursue a more intimate connection to the head. Because none of us is anything without Jesus. None of us is anything without Jesus. You could be a big old bicep. You could be a really wonderfully powerful eyeball. You could be some amazing feet that run fast. But if you're not connected to the brain, all of those elements are just part of a corpse. Get the idea? If you don't have a brain telling you how to walk, how to talk, how to see, how to pick something up, how to move, it's useless. We probably, nobody's asked me to do a translation of the scripture. However, if anybody ever does, I'm going to argue for Jesus is the brain of the church because he causes all the other parts to function. He causes all those other parts to have, their, have their, their completion in him and with one another. To become healthier, we have to be connected to him. I want to pray with you um, this morning, and I'm going to ask you to stand here. Would you, would you stand with me for a moment? You're probably ready to stand up anyway.
And as I kind of mentioned, and we prayed a little bit last week, we're going to do it again this morning. I, I feel like we're supposed to just repent. And the reason that I feel like we're supposed to repent is that so many other things that are not from the Lord have gotten into our understanding of the ecclesia. We think about church in terms of cultural realities. We think about church in terms of our experience. We think about church in terms of what do I get from this? Let me be a little preachy for just a minute. That is not from God. Like, I pastor people, right? We have our hearts broken a thousand times a year. When someone will say, and that, I'm not, this is a generic person, I'm not thinking of in any in particular. We just didn't feel like the church met our needs. And I get what they're saying. They're not, these are not bad people. I get what they're saying. But it's not the right question. The question is, where does God want me in his body? That's the thing. When you figure that out, you got to hold on, you know, till the end. And, let, and I know there are, by the way, there are legitimate reasons to leave a church. There really are. But there's also a lot of illegitimate ones that have nothing to do with hearing the Lord say, this is where I want you to be connected to this particular family. So I want us to repent this morning collectively for just holding on to things that are not biblical, for being more American than we are Christian when it comes to looking at this thing of church, where we are maybe potentially just disregarding other parts of the body, where we've been unwilling to serve and sacrifice and give and give ourselves to the whole, and where most of all we've accepted and, and sometimes even celebrated and, and been envious of spectator models of the body of Christ. Again, that's not a size comment. It's a way of doing church. I want us to pray together this morning and just seek the Lord and ask him to forgive and wash all of that away, to repent from thinking and acting in those, man in those manners so that he might cause us to be more of what he's called us to be here at Grace. So would you pray with me? Would you close your eyes, bow your heads? Father, um, thank you for the name of our church. <laughs> thank you for Grace. Thank you, Lord, that you're not mad at us. You're not mad at us. But I do sense that you're saying, come up higher. Have an, have an, an, an exalted view, a higher view of this beautiful, wonderful, glorious, messy thing called the ecclesia. And Lord, we want that. So please forgive us for where we've looked at the less honorable or unpresentable or weak parts of your body and tried to avoid and dismiss rather than engage in love. Lord, forgive us for that. The person that's difficult to talk to, the person that's, that's hard to listen to, the hard to be around. Lord, I, I know that you will give us grace to love everyone that you call to this particular church well. Help us to lean into you and move toward them. And Lord, where we've viewed our engagement and our connection with the body of Christ from a kind of a consumeristic mindset. What do we get? Lord, please forgive us for that. Lord, may our first thought be, where can I contribute? How can I give of myself? How can I help make someone else stronger? How can I, how can I cover one who's unpresentable? How can I bring honor to someone that's at a deficit when it comes to honor? Lord, may that be our first thought. And Lord, may we as a body be ever looking over our shoulder for someone that's further out, further away, less connected and inviting them to come inside. May our church be like a huge, huge dining room table that we're forever adding more chairs to because more people need to have a place to sit because they're wanted and they matter. May that be our heart as a body even when it's difficult, even when it's annoying, even when it's frustrating, even when we're disappointed. Help us to live that way for your glory. Help us to honor the head who is Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to bless you before you leave today, uh, elders and prayer team members, if you could come up. Um, before I do, if you're here and you are uh, um, not a part of the church, and I don't mean grace, I mean the, the church of Jesus, you don't have a relationship with the Lord, we would so love to invite you to follow Christ today. 
Um, these prayer team members and elders are here. They would love to just take a moment and, and pray with you and in, as you invite Christ to come and be Lord of your life. And he puts you in the body of Christ, that is the church. We would love to be a part of that. So if that's you, as we are concluding here, I'm gonna speak the blessing, but would you come up afterward? And also, if you're here and you just need prayer, maybe you didn't get prayer during the service, we would love to be able to pray for you. Or if you just maybe need to rededicate your life, you need to just set things right with Christ, we're here for whatever you need. So would you close your eyes, extend your hands, let me speak this blessing over you in the name of Jesus. Grace Church family and friends, may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the day when our Lord Jesus comes again. God who calls you, my friends, is faithful and he will do it. In Jesus' name be blessed, amen.